Today we're going to be going over metamorphism, which is the transformation of pre-existing rock into texturally and or mineralogically new rock without melting the rock. And that's the key, because if we melt the rock, then it's going to become an igneous rock. So when we're talking about the uh, pre-existing, that's the parent rock or protolith. That's the rock we're starting with. And um, through the process of metamorphism, it can change mineralogically. For example, you might have a mudstone that's made of little pieces of uh, clay minerals and quartz and feldspar, and it gets metamorphosed and the minerals change. So then we're going to have muscovite and biotite and garnets in there instead. So that would be where you get a mineralogically new rock. Now, texturally new rock, remember texture is the size and the shape and the arrangement of the minerals inside the rock. And so, for example, you could have a limestone that ends up getting metamorphosed and turned into a marble. Limestone is made out of calcite, marble is made out of calcite. So the minerals are the same. What is the difference? Well, the small calcite crystals of the limestone grow into bigger crystals in the um, uh, marble. All right, so anyway, that's metamorphism. Our parent rock is changing in some way into our metamorphic rock. So the parent rock, like I said, the protolith, that's the original rock that turns into a new rock in metamorphism. Now, what causes metamorphism? There's three main causes. There's heat, and heat provides energy for chemical reactions to happen. Heat allows different elements to move around in the rock and bond in different ways and create new minerals. And heat then promotes recrystallization, which is the growth of bigger crystals from smaller crystals. That's like the limestone to marble example, right? Small crystals growing into bigger ones. Heat also is going to make some minerals unstable. Different minerals are stable at different temperatures and different pressures. So if you start changing that, some minerals will become unstable and break down and become new minerals. So heat is one of the causes. Now pressure is another thing that causes metamorphism, elevated pressure on rocks. And there are a couple of different types of pressure. You can have what's called confining pressure. This is also called lithostatic pressure. And this is due to the overlying rocks, right? So when rocks get buried really, really deep, they have the weight of all those rocks uh, above them, creating pressure. And what this confining pressure does is it closes spaces between minerals, right? It compacts things closer together. And it also makes some minerals unstable. Now there is another type of pressure though, and this is differential stress. And differential stress tends to uh, bend and flatten rocks. Right? See, confining pressure is equal in all directions. So it basically just kind of squishes things smaller. But differential stress is stronger in one direction than the other directions. So this is going to end up folding rocks, bending them, and kind of flattening them because it is stronger in one direction over the others. Now the last thing that can cause metamorphism is chemically active fluids. So what we're talking about with these chemically active fluids, these are things like hot water and carbon dioxide. And uh, where do these come from? Well, they come from hydrous minerals, that's minerals that have water in their crystal structure. As they get buried and heated and things, the water will come out of the, uh, out of the mineral. Uh, and the, some of this hot water comes from igneous intrusions as well, right? Those bodies of igneous rock that are deep underground. And chemically active fluids then can significantly change the rocks that they're traveling through because it's going to dissolve some ions, it might precipitate others behind, and so you get a, a major change in the, um, in the rock's composition and mineralogy. Um, metamorphism 
doesn't happen everywhere on the planet. There are certain places that metamorphism is going to happen or, and kind of creates different types of metamorphism. So this is kind of the metamorphic environments or you can also think of it as types of metamorphism that happen in different places. And one of them you guys already know about and it's called contact metamorphism. Remember when we had the igneous intrusion, really, really hot, squeezes its way into the cold country rock and it bakes part of the cold country rock and we get that baked zone? Well, that's actually metamorphic rock. That's metamorphism. And that's what we're seeing right here. Um, the gray is limestone. This dark rock there is uh, an igneous intrusion. And then you see right next to that dark rock, there's this kind of white color. Well, that's where the heat of that igneous intrusion metamorphosed the limestone into marble. And so there's our um, contact metamorphism, where the rock that was in contact with that um, a hot igneous rock ends up getting heated and baked and metamorphosed. Now we can also have a type of metamorphism called hydrothermal metamorphism. And well, this is caused by hot water, right? Hydro refers to water, thermal refers to heat. And so in this case, we have hot water flowing through rocks. You can see some of uh, um, the changes that can happen right here. These were cracks in that rock where hot water flowed through. And you can see right next to the crack, the rock has been altered um, by that hot water flowing through there. And hydrothermal metamorphism can cause some very significant changes in rocks because, like I said, it's going to dissolve some materials and precipitate other materials. And this is some rock that has been altered by hydrothermal metamorphism. And um, you might not be able to tell, but that began life as a granite. Uh, but it's really, really changed because of the hot waters flowing through it. Now we also have burial metamorphism, and um, this happens when rocks get buried deep underground. Right? The deeper they get buried, the more pressure is going to be on them. And usually about the time that rocks get, uh, say, eight kilometers deep, it's uh, gotten hotter in the earth there, and there's this higher pressure at about eight kilometers, and so we start getting some metamorphism at that depth. Now, very deep metamorphism happens in subduction zones. So what a subduction zone is, in certain parts of the world, you have an ocean plate, and this ocean plate sinks underneath another plate. Okay, that's what subduction is. So we have this very um, cold ocean plate sinking underneath another plate, going very deep. It's going to be going hundreds of kilometers deep. So it's going to be under very high pressure. And that's what we get in these subduction zones. We get this high pressure metamorphism because those rocks are being pushed so deep into our planet. We also can have something known as regional metamorphism. Regional metamorphism, as it's, the name suggests, is not something localized, right? Remember, contact metamorphism is very local, right? It's right up against that igneous intrusion. Well, regional metamorphism is going to be over a whole big area. And that's because this occurs when mountains are being formed. So, for example, in the Himalayas today, where India and Asia are colliding with each other, we have these big mountains, uh, the Himalayas slowly being formed and rising upwards, and there's a lot of pressure involved in continents uh, crashing against each other, and that's going to create large areas of metamorphism. And uh, that's what we're trying to show right here. Here's like, uh, this might be India and this might be Asia and they've crashed into each other and built up these mountains. And in the core, in the central part of the mountain, you'll have very high grade metamorphic rocks 
but at the edges of that mountain you'll have lower grade. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, grades of metamorphism. Um, it's basically how changed is the rock from its parent rock. You can imagine uh, at the edges of the mountain range there's not going to be quite as much heat or quite as much pressure but in the central part of the mountain range there's going to be a lot of high heat and high pressure so the rocks are going to change quite a bit in that core of the mountain range. Now these first five types of metamorphism that I, I went over, those are really the most common ones that you're going to see. But there are a few less common types. You don't see them as widespread or as often, but they are still important. You can have fault zone metamorphism. Now fault is where you have a crack in rock and the rock on one side of the crack and the other are sliding alongside each other. And just like if you rub your hands together, you can feel that frictional heat. Well now imagine you have these big areas of rock sliding against each other. You're going to have quite a bit of frictional heat. And uh, so you will get, in a fault zone, um, you can get some metamorphism. In fact, you get a very special type of rock called a myelinite developed in a fault zone. Uh, you won't see any myelinites in, um, in the lab. Uh, this is the Dover Fault in uh, Newfoundland, and you can definitely see the rocks here are different from either side. And that's because that's some of that myelinite that's being formed in the fault zone. Now last but not least, um, you can have impact metamorphism, which is also sometimes called shock metamorphism. This is caused by meteorite impacts. So just imagine you have um, a, I'm sorry, my cat is eating catnip at my feet, so anyway. Uh, so just imagine you have um, a large meteorite slamming into the planet. There's going to be a lot of heat there. There's going to be high pressure when it hits. And uh, you will create some unique uh, minerals from this kind of uh, impact uh, metamorphism. And uh, this is just a good example of a uh, crater created by a meteorite. This is the Barringer Crater in Arizona, also sometimes just uh, called Meteor Crater Arizona. Um, it was created about 50,000 years ago uh, when a meteorite uh, uh, hit this part of the desert. I'm going to pan down and show them. <laughs> All right, so when metamorphic rocks are created, um, we get different textures, right? We've already talked about how igneous rocks have specific textures that tell you something about how they formed, and sedimentary rocks have certain textures that tell you how they were formed. Well, same thing in metamorphic rocks. Remember when we talk about textures, that's the size, shape, arrangement of the minerals inside the rock? Well, the good news with metamorphic rocks, it's not like igneous, right? In igneous, we have that big, long list of like, I don't know, what, 14 different textures that I uh, made you know. In this case, it's a lot shorter list. And we're going to start with what's called a foliation. And a foliation is a planar arrangement of minerals. So, for example, I have this metamorphic rock right here. And do you see how there's these light and dark lines in there? Those are the minerals. This has some uh, biotite and some quartz and feldspar in it. And they're all arranged in these nice lines like that. That's foliation. And when you're identifying metamorphic rocks, one of the first things you should ask yourself is, do I see foliation in that rock? All right, now in, when, if you have a foliated metamorphic rock, uh, how it forms is because of the differential pressure, or differential stress. So you might start with a rock like this, where our, our little minerals are arranged in all kinds of different uh, orientations, but then notice the stress is stronger in this direction than in the other direction, and that causes the minerals 
basically to line up and create that foliation. There are a couple different types of foliation that exist. You can have what's known as slaty cleavage. Okay, slaty cleavage. Actually, I have a dark background. Let's do the red one. Slaty cleavage um, is where the rock is going to split into these very, very flat sheets, and they're also going to be very thin, flat sheets. Now, slate used to be used for uh, blackboards, and it's still used because it's so nice and flat, it's used in billiard tables to have a nice flat surface to play, uh, you know, pool or eight ball or whatever you like playing. So that's slaty cleavage. Now, we also have what's known as schistosity. And schistosity is where you have platy minerals like micas. Remember the muscovite and biotite from lab that I said you could kind of peel apart if you wanted to? Um, well, you have lots of those platy mica minerals in there. They're easily visible and they are what forms the foliation in schistosity. And then we have what's called nisic foliation. And this is where you're going to have light and dark minerals uh, organized in layers. And so it's, that's like the, the rock I picked up that was black and white, right? Light and dark layers. It doesn't have to be black and white. It can be, you know, um, pink and black or gray and black, but it's always something lighter colored and darker colored. Now, our other um, texture that's very important when identifying metamorphic rocks is the ones that are non-foliated. So this is a non-foliated metamorphic rock. Notice you don't see any layers in there, right? You don't see anything like that. And uh, part of the reason you don't see anything like that, there's none of those platy minerals in there. This actually is a piece of marble. It's made from calcite. And calcite tends to form uh, minerals that are equant. They're not, um, uh, they're not flat. And so even if this is under um, high differential pressure, it's still not really going to line anything up in, in layers because there are no layered minerals in there. But in any case, this is non-foliated. So when you're identifying uh, your metamorphic rocks in lab, the question you should ask when you're looking at a rock is, is this foliated or is this non-foliated? That's the important thing to get you started on identifying metamorphic rocks. Now there is one other um, texture, and this is uh, porphyroblastic. This is where you have large crystals known as porphyroblasts surrounded by smaller crystals. And it looks sort of like this. We have these big garnet crystals, and then they're surrounded by smaller uh, muscovite and biotite. You can have foliated porphyroblastic rocks, and you can have non-foliated porphyroblastic rocks. So this is sort of its own special texture that you can find in some metamorphic rocks. All right, so earlier I said we're going to talk a little bit about metamorphic grade. Metamorphic grade being the degree of metamorphism. How much was that parent rock changed? Right? So was it just changed a little bit under low pressure and low temperature, or is that really significantly changed under very high temperatures and pressures? And it really depends on the metamorphic condition, right? especially your temperature and pressure conditions, but also time. And were the, were the rocks under these pressure and temperature conditions for a long period of time or for a very short period of time? Now, what the changes that happen, um, one is textural. So usually, I said usually because there are some uh, exceptions to this, usually the uh, rock will become coarser grained with higher grade. 
which means low-grade metamorphic rocks tend to be fine-grained. You're not going to be able to see all the little minerals in there. And um, uh, higher-grade ones, you're, you're going to have bigger uh, pieces, bigger crystals in there. And of course, the mineralogy changes as well because um, different minerals are stable at different temperatures and pressures. And in volume two, we are going to see how those minerals change.